I think we should start uh, because uh, I'm not fair to keep uh, the people who've already joined waiting. Uh, hi, Yuganj. Hi, uh, Tanya. Uh, hi, Martin. Welcome. Uh, sorry, we started. We're starting this webinar a little bit late because of uh, you know there's two webinars happening in parallel. That one is just ending. Uh, but I'll give a quick introduction. My name is Varun Malik. I'm the CEO of Consolidon. Uh, Consolidon is a new age consulting firm in that we don't uh, necessarily, uh, whenever we have any uh, projects, we don't deliver it with our own consultants, but instead we go to very senior subject matter experts, um, uh, senior people who uh, come in and deliver those projects. Uh, they normally work with boutique consulting firms. Uh, we have about 350 plus boutique consulting firms in our ecosystem. Uh, so what we decided to do is with about 70 of these boutique firms, we decided to set up um, Connected Insights, which is, a, set, uh, which is a series of panel discussions and webinars to help organizations uh, get back on track. Uh, uh, so there's various different tracks. There's talks on sales, there's talks on uh, marketing, there's talks on uh, customer centricity, on private equity, et cetera. Um, and today's talk is being run by uh, Mads Winter. Mads is a, uh, is a personal mentor when it comes to marketing and sales. Uh, so I'm really looking forward uh, to this talk. Um, uh, feel free to participate, ask any questions during the talk. Uh, and uh, what we'll do is during the talk, we'll have a couple of quick giveaways. Uh, so please look out for those. So for example, um, there's options for you to be a part of uh, some of the workshops that we're uh, conducting. There's an option to be a speaker in future uh, webinars. So there'll be a couple of giveaways in the chat. Um, so I think that's uh, about it from me. Handing over to you, Mats. Uh... Thank you so much, Arun. And uh, good morning or welcome uh, to all of you. Uh... I'm actually what happened here is a very good picture of uh, the challenges for sales because uh, you know we should start uh, seven minutes ago and uh, that's one of the challenges for sales they are losing time at the moment because development goes so fast and that means actually what you see today I'll come back to that a little later you see that sales people has less time with customers than ever that means they have less time to do better results because I don't think that any company lower the budget uh, because you have less time. They export, e expect even more still. So I think time is a very important matter here. And you don't, you don't solve a time problem by trying to get more time because time is maybe the most stable resource we have. You get 24 hours every day. You can spend them when you prioritize them, but you don't get more time. And what you didn't do today and you want to do it tomorrow, then something else will be postponed. So time is a very important part of selling. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk into today. We're going to talk into the benefit of working with sales enablement. And I think we have to understand that sales enablement is how do we actually make sales possible, not only for the sales people, for the entire sales organization. And actually, when I see you the next time, next year, we're not going to speak about sales enablement because we are already speaking about the next level of sales enablement called buyer enablement, meaning that how do we actually make it easy to buy? Because if it's easy to buy, then it's easy to sell. And if it's easy to sell, then we are successful. So I hope you understand this algorithm, how it uh, sticks together. So welcome to the benefits of working with sales enablement. I am, uh, of course, as Varun said, I'm representing the company Intense and working very close together with Varun and Consolidan. And um, we believe that there's nothing, there's nothing like luck in success in, 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 uh, when you have a company in sales. Luck is not a matter. And that's why we call our company Intense because we can see when a company work intensely with everything we have to do, customer service, customer centricity, sales, sales enablement, if you work intensely with something, then you succeed. And compared to what about luck, I was so, uh, so few participated yesterday. They know I'm 
pretty close connected to a lot of scientists. And there was a professor actually from the Mauritius. He is a professor in the North America in Chicago. He, uh, he told me a very good story about his students. He asked them a question. He had a group of sales students in a, in a class of sales and marketing. And he asked them a question. And I could ask the same questions to you. And if you have the possibility to, to react, uh, you know you have reactions that you can show me here. Please do that if you want to. Uh, he asked them a question. How many of you believe in luck? And then most of the people, they put up and raised their hand and said, yeah, we actually believe in luck. And then he turned the question around and asked them, how many of you actually think luck believes in you? Then some of them were a little more pessimistic and saying, no, I'm never lucky and it doesn't believe in me. And then he asked them a third question. How many of you believe in luck in sales? Then quite a lot raised their hand and say, yeah, sure, sure. We need luck, we need luck. And then he asked them, okay, does that mean when you create good sales results, you want to be called lucky? And then all of them said, of course, they didn't want to do that. So we had to change. There is no such thing as luck in sailing. There is only being aware, being prepared, being ready, and then still developing. And with these starting words, I welcome you so much. In my 25 years or a little more working with sales development, I actually touched sales enablement a couple of years ago. And the first time I touched it, I saw that this one is a very interesting structure to work very, very structured, very efficient developing our sales. It's also a mindset. It's also a way of understanding uh, that sales has to be enabled. It doesn't enable itself. And that's one of the problems that very often we've talked about that sales is something that just happened and that's not good enough. We need to be much, much more structured. So today I'm gonna take you pretty fast through a very big topic, a topic called sales enablement. I'll tell you a little about what it is. I'll also tell you what it isn't because a lot of people think something about sales enablement that it isn't. And I'm not gonna blame companies like HubSpot uh, 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 showpad and all these tools that we see, they call the tools for sales enablement. And in my opinion, this is definitely not right. These tools is just part of sales enablement. So I'll go a little deeper into that a little later. And then I'm going to show you why you should spend time on sales enablement. Their benefits are so in uh, tremendous if you can really touch these. And then I'll give you example of how you can structure and start. But I'm going to tell you as well, this job has never is never finished. It's an ongoing process because sales enablement, that, that's a little like if you want to go on a diet, you can go on a diet, but if you really want to succeed, you have to change your lifestyle. That's the same here. Sales enablement is not a, it's not a diet. It's a, a change in the way you work with sales. So it's a mindset and it has to be habits and it's a lifelong learning. But just before I'll go also a little to the flip chart, you see already the model is here behind me. I'll go into some uh, reasons why sales enablement really, really matters right now. There is, we actually now, we are, we are heading in, we are in the fourth industrial revolution. Shortly going through the four industrial revolutions, the first one came when we got all the machines. We got the steam machines and we were able to produce and manufacture a lot of things without so much hard work that changed a lot for a lot of people and created more workspaces, but nothing hit sales. The second industrial revolution was transportation. We got easier transportation with railroads and lorries and, and we created even more workspace workplaces, but we didn't uh, hit sales. And then we got in the 60s and 70s, we got not IT as we know it, but computers, old computers that were able of in enabling more efficiency in in manufacturing, especially accountants were hit. You could do a lot of things on, on old school computers. They were huge as towers, but they were really changing some of the manual administrative work and that changed a lot of made us more efficient. Sales was not hit. And then we got the fourth industrial revolution, the digitalization. That really hit sales because now it was enabling buyers to get more information. And it also made a lot of this, the, the, the approaches to the market 
much more difficult because what happened was that we could use the internet, we could use all the digital tools and now sales had to change because we used to see sales as a man with his, uh, with his uh, bag and a car driving around, shaking hands of clients and that is totally changed. This is not the world of selling anymore. Salespeople waking up in the morning, looking if I'm going east or going west. I want to go with where the sun is shining. Uh, I want to go this way today. That's not going to happen because that's not going to succeed in the future. That's why sales enablement can help us. And just look at these figures here. They're really scary. 56% uh, of sales leaders and managers see that their sales force is efficient. Try to imagine that nearly half of sales leaders and managers already admit my sales team, my sales force is not efficient. That will never happen. If you were in sport, you really have to work with your team and say, we need something to be done. And then it's really interesting. If you ask again, sales leaders and managers, they only see that they have significantly developed the sales force the last 12 months. And, and to be honest, 12 months is a decade today because changes run faster than ever. So we really call for development when only 43% see that they have significantly developed the sales force. So what we, need, what we need to look into here is definitely, sorry, is definitely that we have to uh, look into how we can change it. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna change my screen. I'm gonna go to the, to the flip chart and give you a little, background of what we actually want to achieve. This is the sales enablement model. I'll come back to that a little later. Before I do that, I want to show you the most important whys of doing sales enablement. These two models is the, the background of sales enablement. First of all, when we look at this, here we have these axes. And when I draw this box, this box symbolizes the result of our company in 2020. Let's just say 2020. This was the result in 2020. This result was created by a number of customers. And here we could look into the customer mix, how many A, B and C clients. And those of you participating in yesterday's webinar with Bert, Below the segmentation is not only about A, B, and C, it's also about behavior, need, and how they work. But that's a different thing. That's also very important for sales enablement. This is one part. The other one is the potential. And that means how great did we actually take part of the potential with the clients? And here we have what is called, so to speak, the product mix. That's how good we are in using the, so, uh, the, the, the variety of products we have and we can just say X, Y, and Z product. This result was created in 2020 by not only the sales people, but by the company. Now we all know that in 2021, we're gonna improve this result, increase it. And then in 2022, we're gonna do the same. In 2023, we're gonna do the same. So what we actually gonna do is, we're going to work with generating new sales, getting leads, new selling. We're going to generate more potential, upselling, cross-selling, more selling. That means here we're going, to, we're going to hunt for more sales. And then, of course, we're going to stop. What can happen is we get leads in and we lose customers. We lose customers because every time you lose a customer, we lose, first of all, we lose profit and turnover, but we also lose a lot of time spent getting in our portfolio. And that's a big, huge problem because if we lose too much customers, we have to get new customers. And I don't know if in your company, I don't know if you know when you actually, when, when a customer is profitable. That's one of the points I'll get back to, because what I see is a lot of salespeople, they don't know when, it, when they actually earn money. They think they do from the beginning, but they don't understand the whole chain of things done to get a customer in. And it's definitely, in most businesses, it's definitely cheaper keeping them in the business than achieving new uh, business. This model here 
is a basic and fundamental model for understanding what sales enablement is about. It is about having this development in a structured and not by coincidence way. Now we're back to luck and now we're back to plan. If this happened by luck, then you didn't do it. If it happened because you made a plan and you worked structured, then you did it. So what we actually have to do is we have to grow this platform, this portfolio, so that 21 will be better than 20, that 22 will be better than 21. Maybe we say goodbye to some clients. Maybe we say goodbye to some of the services and focus on those that are really the best one. This is one part. This is a very important tool to understand. This is planning your sales and understanding your sales. And then to do this, we look into one of the other tools that are very important. As a salesperson and as a sales leader, I have to create results. Results we just saw here. Results can be new customers, upselling, more selling, earning more money, getting profit, having new leads getting in. The results at the end of my activities. Activities we have to look upon a little different because as you see here, we have three, uh, we have three uh, folks uh, folk, uh, uh, here that we can actually work with. The first one is the one that is the normal thing that most sales leaders work with. That is actually taking part of uh, controlling the effort of the salesperson. That means controlling the activities. And normally when you want to create a bigger platform, what you say to your salespeople is do more. The problem is most of them cannot do more. That means you kill motivation and you still try to get them to do more. But the problem is when they do more, you lose some quality. But effort, of course, effort is a very important part. But most sales leaders, unfortunately, measure so much on quantity that you lose quality. Another one, another part of activities and effort is prioritization. That means we have here quantity and we have here priority. That means if we want to get new leads, new, new prospects, new customers, then you have to make sure that your salespeople and your sales force is not working too much on the old existing clients. But if you don't do that, you lose them. So here you really have to take prioritization. If you want to force your sales team to go to get new leads who should take care of the existing clients. So here is the first part. That is the most easy part to work with activities and effort because you can measure them. Another very important part is not only effort, is it efficiency? Efficiency is about behavior. That is how strong is the salesperson to structure a meeting? How strong is the salesperson to use the right arguments, handle objections, close handle price objections, build up the, the uncovering and activating needs, presenting solution? And here, what we see is that a lot of the salespeople are old school because they have today to use virtual meetings, build up online meetings, and they get less time out there with the clients. I'll show you in a minute. They get less time. So we need to change quality. That means we need to change behavior. We need to, we have to learn them what to do. And you will not win. Here, a little root set. If, if sales managers normally focus here and forget this part, what you do is you, you see that your people are doing, doing bad, but you ask them to do more. So what you actually get is, you, you hire this and you know that this is low, so you, you get them to do more shit, so to speak, because they do shitty. So this is a problem. You have to understand the solution to better results is not necessarily more activities. It could be less, but the right ones with the right quality. And to, and to manage this, we need to understand that right in the middle of this is the heart and the brain understanding of what we're doing. That means if you want to change the result, you need to change the way people do activities and the efficiency and quality. And the tool, the key to change it comes here. 
you have to make them understand what kind of changes are we doing? Why are we doing them? How should we change? And what can you do? This is exactly the key in sales enablement that if you want to change a result, you start by changing the understanding, the mindset, the behavior of your sales force. And if you don't do that, you're back to luck. Then you're lucky. And right now, I work with a group of, of real estate agents. They are like 1,200 real estate agents. Right now, their results are amazing. All of the, the shops with these real estate agents are doing amazingly. But they are not aware of one thing. The market for real estates right now is tremendous. So when I ask them, you're doing good, but are you doing the best you can? They said to me, look at the results. And I said, yes. But when I get the measures, all of you are losing market share every day. That means your competitors are doing better than you. So when times get bad or tough, will you then be ready to win a less big market? That's how you actually have to understand that if you only look at results and you don't look here, then you don't understand anything. And if you don't compare results to actually what's happening in the market, then it's a problem. That's also why in my mind, doing a budget is a little old school because if I did a budget in 2019 for 2020, I did a budget and then COVID-19 came, what could I use a budget for? The problem is that every time you do well, you think that going over the budget is amazing. And every time you do bad, you think budget is something from hell. You have to stop thinking that much about budget being fixed because if a market changes, budget can go up, budget can go down. They be to, need to be more dynamic. And that's one of the problems that old school sales leadership has been very static. It's about, uh, I, I, I started out being a salesman 25, 27 years ago. At that time, the, the measurement was that you had, you had to have two meetings every day except Friday, eight meetings. And then a couple of years ago, I spoke to this old company that I worked in. They are still working with eight physical meetings a week. Maybe it's wrong, maybe it's right. It's not about the number, it's about did they actually think or was it just some inheritance that was brought because the, the old time was two meetings a day. This is one of the problems. I'll show you some figures why it's a problem. I see somebody in the chat. Uh, yeah, sales is not luck, definitely. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll just show you a little here from the screen. I share again, I hope you see my screen. First of all, we saw the sales managers see that they had to develop their team. Here you see the efforts, the will, efficiency, it is our tuning fork. And if I was tuning a musician instrument, I had to tune it by more things than just one. And here we can tune it by efforts, will, and efficiency. But why is it so important to go into this? Because what happened over years is that we've done it really, really difficult to be a successful salesperson. Let's just take these five figures before we go into the sales enablement model. What we see is in average that 4.3 person is involved in an, a sale from internal. That means every time a salesman sells something, he has to engage with 4.3 person. Could you imagine how much communication, how much time is spent, how much coordination? And the big problem here is if these handovers and coordination is not done okay, who is then the victim? The customer. So here's one of the things we need to arrange. And I don't think this figure will go down because a lot of things get more and more complicated. And that's okay, but that means we need to structure it well. And what is also interesting is that this 4.3 person, all of them more or less is involved in sale but some of them see they're just operation. We come back to that. That's one of the problems. In the middle, you see 53% of sales reps 
in the B2B world reach their target. Could you imagine 53%, that's nearly a little more than half of salespeople in the world reach their target. Could you imagine that if you were responsible for a hospital or responsible for the airport and 53% of the airplanes were landing safely, could you imagine that somebody will call you successful? If you were responsible for a hospital and 53% of your surgery and operations went well, would you be successful? So here we are in two problems. Either salespeople are very bad in budgeting or they are extremely unstructured, working bad, not good enough to reach their target. Anyway, we're just accepting that they didn't reach it. Then I could ask if we just accept it, why do we then use a target? Why do we then use a budget? It seems like it's valueless and we just use it because we used it for years. I would never be satisfied if you could tell me that only half of what I'm doing is successful. And then we look at the right one, 62% of sales rep, they see that internal administration, communication, coordination is the major challenge for doing sales. It might be an excuse. It might be because they don't understand how important it is. But whatever it is, it's a problem. Because if every six out of 10 salespeople is running around feeling that they're demotivated because of internal administration and communication, then it's a problem. And who will be the victim in the end? The customer. This is also what sales enablement is about. How can we, so to speak, kill this because this is not good enough? Then we have this one. I know some of you maybe participated in my seminar yesterday, uh, and it was very much about this one. We see that 73% of sales time is spent with customers not ready to buy. Then we could look at this one. I'm just going back to the flip chart here. We could look at the effort. If 73% of the time is spent with customers not ready to buy, we don't get very far by just having more effort. We need to do the right thing at the right time. That means maybe we have to take speed out of sales to get higher results instead of creating more speed and then spending more time together with people not ready, ready to buy. And then we have the last one. 35% of salespeople's time is spent on selling. This problem, we can, we can just relate it to any other business. Try to imagine that you were a doctor in a hospital and only 35% of your time was spent together with patients. That's a big problem. So what actually sales enablement is about is we want to get it easier to do selling, a better customer experience. We want to have more people reach the target. We want to approach the customers at the right time. And we want to have more time on selling, but at the right time. This is the idea of actually sales enablement. And now I'll go into this model of sales enablement. And any questions, feel free to ask any question during the session or bring up some comments if you want that. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go to the other uh, camera and then I'm gonna look into this because this model was created. Uh, I did it actually together with some research and scientists, professors, and uh, it was based on a lot of these models that were around the world. But a lot of the sales enablement had a little mistake because they always thought that if you got a new system, then you will change behavior. And I think all of us, we know that having an IT system doesn't necessarily change behavior. And what happened was that, you know, all these iPads and computers and all of that, you, what actually happened was that marketing and, uh, and companies started creating amazing tools that salespeople should use. And if they use that, sales will be more efficient. That was the first definition of sales enablement. We wanted to, to coordinate the way salespeople done, do their selling. And we wanted to make presentations on iPads. We want to have surveys they could, could uh, uh, fill out. We had questionnaires they could use with the clients. But the salespeople were not ready to do it. So what we could see was that, that only like 40% used these tools. There's nothing wrong with the tools. It's amazing tools but they created 
a problem instead of a solution. So to look into this, we need to see the sender. The sender is actually what is the most important thing of the sales enablement. The sender in the middle, I'll just put it with two letters, C, J, or C, sorry, C, X, C, X. CX, some of you remember from yesterday, CX is customer experience. We always put the customer experience in the middle, not only to be customer centric, but because everything in our sales should come from the customer experience. And that means we have to understand the customer journey. Some of you saw that yesterday, I'll dig into it again today in a different way, because I'll just put this up here. I'll draw this. Here is the customer journey. Boom, I'll come back to that in a minute because sales enablement is about, first of all, understanding the customer journey. And then secondly, it's about understanding our entire sales force. Sales force, not as the CRM system sales force, not as the sales people, but as the entire company who is actually engaged with customers at certain points. That means here in the middle, you see this circle and this circle, they are like running around each other. And the less friction we get here, the less power we get here, sorry, the more power we get, the better results. Because here, this touch point between customer experience and Salesforce is a lot of touch points. These touch points is every time a customer approaches and we speak to them. Every time we approach a customer and speak to them. Every time that happens, this is the touch point on the journey. So what we see here is we have to understand the customer journey and I'll make it very, very, very simple. Because here customers are prospects, here they are buyers and here they are users don't care about the size of this it was just an example this is the customer journey the minute they start examining what they should buy some of you saw it yesterday in the infinity loop they get aware they examine they research and then suddenly they decide to buy and then they have a solution of buying getting started onboarding and then they get users and they want to buy more and they want to keep on buying this one should be very, very long and hopefully never ending. What I did in a company I work with was that we put this one up and then we said, okay, if we have the customer journey, then we have to look into the sales process. And we have to look into this and say, okay, who in our company is responsible for what at a certain time when? And how should they do it and why? What is the benefit? That means who take care of lead generation? Who, who contact leads? Who speaks here? First of all, here we got, we found out in this company that we had a marketing that created digital campaigns. We found out they had an inbound call center that took care of the calls internal it, when, when the buyers call into them. So we found out here, there's a lot of people that who should do what, when, how, and why. And the minute we can answer this, then we know the touch points. Then at a certain moment when people are ready to buy, then again, now they get into being customers. And when you're a customer, you go from lead to a customer. And then again, we can ask the same, well, who should do what, when, how, and why? Because now we got also our financial department engaged. We got maybe our technicians engaged. We got our service department engaged. We got the sales people engaged at a certain time here. So what we define now is who actually touches the client at certain points and what do we expect them to do? And then of course, every time you do that, I'll just give an example here. You create handovers. And these handovers, handover means that somebody has 
to get rid of the customer, to bring it to the next one. And could you imagine that I throw a ball and nobody's ready to catch it? Then it's a problem. And what actually is one of the biggest problem when you want to do this is that people are not ready or don't want to catch the ball or don't want to throw it. That means that the sales guy think he can drive them from all here to all here. Because what you have here, then you go from being a customer to an ambassador, a user that really wants to buy more, buy again, make references, tell other people to come. And then we could decide again, who, when, what, how, and why. And then we had all these touch points and we found out that the salesperson is only doing some of these touch points. And we defined in this company, we actually defined, I think it was 76 or 75 touch points. All of them were not important. So none of them, all of them were not that important, but they were all done. And nobody knew that they touched the client, the client 76 times. So we had to define what are the most important touch points. Could we maybe change some of them because what actually happened also and that was so annoying for the client that was at this time they were called by four people to start working with the company is that efficient no way try to imagine that you arrive in a hospital you have to go into a surgery and then four people get to to ask you more or less the same questions will you feel secure will you feel safe First, the nurse asks you a question, then the doctor asks you the same question, and a doctor asks you the same question. Will you feel okay if this asks you four times the same question? You will definitely not, as a customer, feel it's engaging. And what we talk about here is making it easy to buy. That's why I talk about buyer enablement, because this is actually this. So what we see when we work with sales enablement is, you cannot work with sales enablement if you don't start in here. And that's why a lot of companies started wrong with sales enablement, because what they did is they started out getting systems. And to understand this, here you see the axis here. This axis symbolizes system versus people. That means, and this is not opposites. This is just because here we're talking about people Acting, people doing something, here we talk about systems. And systems is only made for making things easier. If they don't make things easier, then get rid of them. Or find out how they could make things easier. I've seen a lot of companies building amazing CRM systems with all structure and information, but they don't use them. And that means you build something you don't need, just like building the biggest castle and palace and don't use the rooms. Maybe that happens sometimes, I don't know. But this is a bad situation because resources are scarce in a company. So first of all, we have this access. Then secondly, we have here operational. That means I'm actually doing, I'm acting. And then here we have guiding. Guiding means showing direction. So what we actually get here is we get four areas of how we work with sales enablement. And you need to understand that the basic part of doing sales enablement is that you have to have this in mind and the customer experience, touch points, the journey, the sales force, that's the basic. But before that, you need to have your strategy. Who is your target clients? What is the market you're hitting for? What kind of product you wanna sell? And if you don't make your basic strategy, you will never succeed. So doing this, everything starts in the middle. And then we have a step here and it actually goes very precisely around like this. The first one is leadership and incentives. Leadership and incentives are two things. First of all, leadership is not sales leadership because I see in a lot of companies, and then I go back to this one. One of the biggest problems here was that we had in, involved in this, we had a sales manager, 
a service manager, a manager for operations, a CFO responsible, we had marketing responsible, we had six or seven leaders engaged, but they didn't have the same mindset because some of them just wanted to follow compliance. Some of them wanted to give the most amazing customer experience. So everything in sales enablement doesn't start with the sales people. It starts from the top. Just like if you want to wash your stairs, start from the top, don't start from the bottom. They get pretty dirty if you start from down. If you start from the top, you start here. So what you create here is a unity in leadership, understanding this one, and then you have to show that incentives can be a very big problem. Try to imagine that you have a salespeople, you have salespeople that is on a commission base. And this commission base is just for selling. They don't care that much about retention, getting ambassadors. They just want to sell. That means they don't care about handovers. They don't care about anything else. The minute they close the deal, they are out of there. Is that a good experience? No. That means you have to create, and, and maybe the service people, they don't get any benefit from doing more selling and they only get hourly paid. Why should they try to do something extra? No way. So what you have to look into is your incentives because in a lot of companies, these incentives, they kill people motivation. So this one you need to look at. And of course, if you think, wow, this is a big one, I'll give you a little later, I'll show you how to start. And then of course, most of you will need some, somebody to guide you. But these are guiding examples because leadership and incentives will guide us. Then what we have to look into is our sales process. Not only the sales, also the service, service and sales process and collaboration. How do we actually work together? You see what we're already doing now? We talk about this. We have to define all these handovers, who is doing what at a certain time. We need to make sure that things they fit because these fingers will fit, they will not fit now. And that means we have to define this and that's a good job to do because what we also find out when we do it is that certain things we can just stop doing. We can just stop doing because there's no value. And the minute you cannot find the why in something we do, then get rid of it. Then what we see now is, now we have control of leadership and intensive, they should guide us. We have the stage process and collaboration that should guide us. Then we need one thing down here, and that is a very important part. We need to have IT systems, insights, business intelligence. What do I mean by that? These are systems that can support here. Never have a system that doesn't support your collaboration. What I see is a lot of times people buy systems and then trying to design process. I would make a process and then find the system. And then of course, maybe the system is only 80% or 60%. That's okay, maybe it's okay. Here we also have insights. Insights, what could that be? Let's go back here. Which of our clients actually bring money to the table? What we normally see is that when you ask salespeople, they have their favorites. They had their, they really loved clients. And maybe these clients are not the one we're earning money on. Maybe we spend time on the wrong client uh, uh, industry. Maybe we don't sell the right products. What we need to do is we need to have an overview here and get all these insights and then use them to optimize our process. And that takes leadership because in a lot of companies, what I see is you get reports, you get key figures, you get a lot of information, but you don't use them for anything. And that means if you don't use them to change prioritization, to change process, if you don't use them for anything, why then have them? There's no reason for do that. So we actually have to understand that this is a very important part that we can gather this information and it gets easier and easier. What it can also do is, I done this in a company, we designed the process. And what we also did was we exposed the salespeople, we gave them iPads with product presentations. That meant they had all the tools because we're talking also tools here. They have all the tools they needed, 
they all the tools they needed to close the deal immediately. So what actually was interesting here was that when we started out, we could see, if we look at this one here, we could see in average, they needed five meetings to close one deal. This is a hit rate of 20%. If you want more sales here, what you normally will do is demand more activities. We said differently. We said we need to do differently. We want to go down to that they can close one deal in three meetings. Because then if we can have more meetings, we get more deals. To change this, if I want to change this, I need, first of all, to change prioritization, change the things they're doing in the meeting. I need to change their behavior because if they are doing as they do today and I expect a change to come on result without changing behavior, then I am, as I said to somebody yesterday, I am hit by the thought of insanity. If I think that something will change without changing behavior, I tried it several times. I, do, I don't lose weight by thinking. I lose weight by doing. So I need to change behavior because then I could bring this one to three meetings to one soul, sale here. And to do this, I need to start working with the understanding of the what to do, the why to do, and here, the how to do. And if people don't understand the why and the what, I will never get them to do the how. And what I could see, I worked with a couple of these amazing companies. There's a Danish company called Templify. They made all these tools that actually means in one system, a salesman can start doing a presentation. He can change it when he's with the client. He can make the presentation into a proposal. He can send it immediately. He can get the acceptance digital, and then he can send an order confirmation. He can do all the thing here. Try to imagine. We take maybe three or four things and take them out of, of, of the doing here. This system is an amazing system. I've seen how it can actually measure. It can measure if a sales guy is in a one hour meeting. It can measure in the iPad in the system. It can measure how many minutes you spend on the introduction, how many minutes you spend on presentation, how many minutes you spend on uncovering needs, how many minutes you spend on every slide. They can uncover everything. But how do you see salespeople see this system? Do you think they see it as a development tool or a kind of controlling what they're doing? And the minute they see it as control, that you're following up, you're watching me, Big Brother is watching me, what do you think happened to motivation? So what we had to do is we had to take the system and make sure that we have all the processes and find out where does it make sense to use this system. And we had to engage the leaders to understand because now we hit the last part we hit the part where we empower and make capabilities ready to do. That means we have to train the salespeople to understand what they should do. But we also in the same company found out that when the salesman has closed the deal, the best one to do more selling was the technician. He was more trustworthy. He knew more about the specification of the product. He came more frequently with the client. But do you think that it was natural for a technician to do sales? No. So we again have, how can we support him to support the process? And how can we as a leadership guide him and empower him? So that means when you start here, you always start by understanding the client. Then you start understanding your sales force and the touch points you have. Then you engage and align with leadership and incentives. Then you start building your structure, your processes, how you collaborate, the, the handovers. Then you look at systems, how systems can support you. And maybe you get insights and maybe you find out that some of the things you want to do was not easy, 
it, it was not worth doing it. And then you empower and engage and make building capabilities. And yes, this might lead to that some of your salespeople is what I call a walking dinosaur. That means maybe they are not for the future, but for the past. Then you have two options, sorry to say. Change or leave. And that is your job as a leader. Because if you don't let go of them, you're killing other people in the sales force. So this is sales enablement. These seven steps, this is sales enablement. And it starts like that, and that's how you build it up. And I know it seems pretty simple. And I know it takes sometimes a coach, that's lucky for me, to guide you through this. And I'll just give you a couple of, maybe there's a question here, I'll just see. Uh, no, it was just a giveaway. Amazing how these giveaways are done. Thank you, Kanika. And then um, I'll just uh, go to my other camera here. Yes. And then I'll share again the screen. Because now we are back to what it's really all about. This is all about this structure you see here. Customers in the middle, surrounded by the entire sales force. This gives us all the touch points, the handovers. Everything is driven by the customer. And we have to understand some of these companies that can really do this. How, how can Amazon actually win a situation without having a product? Because they really understand this. And then you build the leadership and incentives. You do collaboration and process, insights and technology, and then you build capabilities and empowerment. Okay, why is this interest? Because when you look into how strong people has implemented sales enablement, then you divide it into low maturity, maturity, are you really doing it or high maturity? How far did you go? And what you see is, those companies working with sales enablement, they have 35% of the salespeople reaching their target in low maturity, but 68 of salespeople reaching target in high maturity. That means it's double. That means the more you work with this, and, and low maturity is very often people not working with sales enablement. So here is a really benefit. And the guidelines is if you should start this, you should actually start by exploring the customer journey, the fine touch points. Then you should definitely build sales as a team, a team between leaders and a team between marketing, sales, service, technicians, uh, accounting. You have to understand everybody in the company is taking part of sales because if you don't do that, you're killing it. Sales is no longer a one man job. It's not about the heroes coming down, coming back on the horse, killed somebody out there and, and winning an order. It is about a sale. Selling is become a team game. And then you can start building a playbook. And I know we didn't go that far into a playbook, but building a playbook is actually more or less defining most of the areas in the sales enablement. I will uh, a little further on this year, I'll do a webinar on, on how to build a playbook and why do it. Because a playbook is not a static, it's a dynamic way of making clear what are we actually doing for the customers? Who is our main target customers? Who's our dream customers? What is our uh, process? What is our handovers? What is the most amazing arguments? What, how do we handle objections? How do we measure success in sales? Because if the only thing you measure uh, success in sales by is the result, then you're a little old school, right? Because results come from activities. And if you measure activities, and the quality of activities, you can change them, but result is only changed by changing activities. So just to sum this up, these are the first four steps I would recommend you. And if you don't know how to start, I'll be more than happy to guide some of you to start this. And then I'll just end by saying as one of my old really idols, uh, good old Mr. Philip Cutler, who actually invented the four Ps about price, product, promotion, and place. He actually changed them. I'll go into that deeper in another webinar one day. Uh, he changed them because these four Ps are no longer really uh, fulfilling what we should have today because they are changed by, uh, you can say place is uh, changed by channels because maybe we don't have a physical place. Product is no longer just product. It's also about services and actually how we engage with people. Also, some of you heard Karina yesterday, how do we do co-creation? 
And promotion is definitely not no longer about marketing. It's also about communication and engaging on the social media. But what he said, Philip Cutler, yes, the sales department isn't the whole company, but the whole company better be the sales department. This is very interesting because I've been in a lot of company where the war was going on internally between sales, service, finance. And if we compete and fight so much internally, we are not ready to fight externally. So what we have to build is to build companies that understand that the entire company is sales. Sales has become a function and the function can only be successful if all organs in the body work well. You know, our body has a lot of functions. They are supported by organs. And if our lungs or the liver or the kidney doesn't work, then the function is not working and then the body will not be working. They have to work together. So by these words, I wanna say thank you so much. I hope you enjoy it. And please in the chat, write a comment. What did you bring from here? Please write what is the most important takeaway you have that will be really nice if you would do that. So please, thank you so much for today. You will all receive the material and presentation. And then I know Kanika, we also recorded it, but please write in the chat, what is your takeaway from here? Have an amazing day out there, all of you. Take care. Thank you, Mads, for that session. And before um, everybody drops off, um, I just want to um, click a quick picture, if you can all switch on your videos and uh, let's take a nice picture to sum up the session. Thank you, Reshmi. I see Paul, Samuel. Thank you, Dwarkanath. Can we have a couple of more videos, if possible? So many nice faces to see on Monday morning. Thank you all for listening in, and uh, um, you know, I hope you benefited from this session. So, everybody, say cheese. I'll take a quick picture. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you so much all for joining. Um, just. You.